Welcome to another video on CCRN review. This one is for the renal system. I'm Brent and let's get started. So the CCRN renal testable areas include acute renal failure, chronic renal failure, hemodialysis, life-threatening electrolyte imbalances, and everything in between. So I'll start off with renal anatomy. The functional unit of the kidney is called the nephron, which has both a vascular and a tubular system. Each kidney has approximately 1 million nephrons, of which play an important role in the fluid balance and electrolyte balance within the body. The vascular system in the nephron contains an artery, an afferent arteriole, a capillary system, which is called the glomerulus, and an afferent arteriole, and a vein. The afferent arteriole brings the blood to the glomerulus, and the efferent arteriole is the blood going away from the glomerulus. So that's the filtered blood, essentially. So the efferent arteriole is the pre-filtered blood. The efferent arteriole is the filtered blood. The tubular anatomy of the nephron contains the Bowman's capsule, a proximal tubule, the loop of Henle, a distal tubule, and the collecting ducts. Most of the absorption and or excretion happens within the proximal tubule. So the nephron must maintain a pressure gradient, which is going to optimize the blood flow. And this gradient can change based on the cardiac output, the types of drugs the patients are on, and the conditions the patients are in, such as sepsis and or uh, states of infection. So a condition which impedes this pressure gradient will cause compensatory mechanisms implemented. So let's say in a state of severe infection, sepsis, when you have hypotension in the late stages of sepsis, their efferent arteriole, the arteriole bringing blood to the glomerulus, will dilate, which will increase blood flow to the glomerular capillaries. At the same time, the efferent arteriole will constrict decreasing flow from the glomerular capillaries. So what this does is increases the pressure and essentially will allow the glomerulus to be perfused appropriately and to be able to do its job. That's the basics of the renal anatomy for the CCRN. There's other anatomy involved, however, this is not as essential other than just understanding the concepts of how the kidney functions as far as the nephron and what will affect that nephron from, uh, from functioning appropriately. So important lab values, we have blood urea and nitrogen, the BUN, please do not call it the BUN. The normal values of the BUN is 10 to 23 milligrams per deciliter. This is going to vary on the laboratory that your hospital uses, but just know generally 10 to 23. This is useful for measuring the level of serum nitrogen that the liver forms as a waste product from metabolism. This is not as useful for indicating the renal function, such as the serum creatinine. The elevated BUN level is called uremia, and the patient is in a uremic state. So this condition, the conditions that cause the elevation of a BUN is dehydration and shock. So essentially, it will be a concentration of nitrogen in the blood. Moving on to the creatinine. So creatinine is the waste product of skeletal muscle metabolism, and this is a better indication of renal function than the BUN. The normal level for males is 0.8 to 1.4 milligrams per deciliter, and this is because generally males typically have more mass, and the females, the normal level of creatinine is 0.6 to 1.1 milligrams per deciliter. So the best indicator for monitoring the renal function, otherwise known as the glomerular filtration rate, is obtaining a 24-hour urine creatinine clearance. The 24-hour urine needs to be placed on ice for the entire time until it gets to the lab. So what is the GFR? The GFR is the volume of plasma filtered through the glomerular capillaries into the Bowman's capsule per minute. So the normal GFR is approximately 125 mL per minute and is inversely related to the serum creatinine. So this means that as the creat serum creatinine rises, your GFR is going to be lower. Normal urine volume is approximately 1,000 milliliters per day. That's going to vary widely on how much input the patient is getting. However, on average, this is about 1,000 a day, which 99% of the filtrates being reabsorbed from the urine. So large molecules in the urine indicate glomerular damage as only small filtrates are filtered, not allowing large molecules to pass. So the glomerular membrane is a very tight-knit membrane. and When you have large molecules in the urine, that means that these, this membrane is damaged, essentially. So some other important lab values are obtaining a urinalysis, urine electrolytes, urine cultures can also be beneficial. 
And the patients in the state of proteinuria were saying that there is protein in the urine. So this is important for detecting early diabetic neuropathy which is going to say that damage is being done to the kidney, to the glomerular membrane from diabetes. Normal albuminuria is less than 20 milligrams per day of albumin in the urine. Microalbuminuria is approximately 30 to 300 milligrams a day of albumin or, or protein. So that's, that's quite a lot. Proteinuria is considered greater than 300 milligrams per day of albumin excreted or protein. This is the same level that is used to be one of the markers for eclampsia for pregnant ladies. So important to understand that serum albumin, if low, may, be de may decrease oncotic pressure. So if you're, there's been a lot of albumin excreted in the kidneys, you're, you're naturally your serum albumin is going to be a little bit lower, especially if this patient has other comorbidities and malnutrition. What happens when you have a decrease in oncotic pressure? That means that essentially the vascular system within the body is going to be losing a lot of oncotic pressure. This can make a patient edematous. Just remember for the test, an edematous patient can be intravascularly dehydrated. So just remember that just because they look like they're in a state of fluid overload, they may not actually be vascular wise. Other important lab values include specific gravity. The normal, again, this is going to vary depending on your laboratory, but for the test, approximately 1.010 to 1.020 is going to be your normal specific gravity. Some will have it 1.005 to 1.030. Just be understand that 10 to 20 is roughly the normal range. Serum creatinine kinase is another important level to look at. Not necessarily for renal function, but to understand why this patient may be going into renal failure. The creatinine kinase can indicate rhabdomyolysis, which often causes acute renal failure. This is caused from a bunch of breaks down from muscle uh, damage or trauma or metabolism. This can happen for varying amounts of reasons, from myocardial infarction, for significantly prolonged immobilization. So if you, you've heard about the elderly uh, gentleman or the elderly woman that's fell and laid there for 12 hours and ends up in acute renal failure because of the C CK levels are extremely elevated, like 20-something thousand. So just be understand that the CK does not indicate renal failure. The, you're only going to measure this to see why they are in renal failure if that's one of the causes because some of the treatments can be slightly different. So another important lab values to get, again, is to evaluate for what state of kidney failure this patient's in is the arterial blood gases. That means there could be a decrease in the reabsorption of sodium and water in this sort of acidosis. So some of the clinical assessments helpful is an ultrasound, which could be helpful for understanding the kidney size, uh, kidney stones, extreme urinary retention, and other useful information for the kidney as, f as far as the kidney is concerned. Bladder distension can also indicate an outlet obstruction such as prostate or cancer or tumor or strictures or something like um, a neurogenic bladder from a neurological disease or diabetes. Flank pain can indicate a possible uh, urinary tract infection. You have several types of renal failure, and it's important to know that acute kidney injury, AKI, is an acute increase of the serum creatinine by greater than or equal to 1.5 of baseline within seven days. So there's this criteria that you have to, the serum creatinine has to be significantly elevated within one week to be, to be considered acute kidney injury. There's some criteria here on this table. The serum creatinine criteria and the urine output criteria. So this determines what stage of acute kidney injury this patient is in. This table is a good guideline as far as the CCRN test is concerned in determining whether or not you are in acute kidney injury or acute kidney failure and all the way up to end stage kidney disease. Your creatinine criteria for risk is the increase of creatinine 1.5 to 1.9 times the baseline. And your urine output criteria is less than 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour times 6 hours. So if you see, this is not over 7 days like the definition above. This is just in a general state of the patient, what's going on right now. And this is going to be a risk for kidney injury or kidney failure if your creatinine and urine output are doing these numbers here.
So moving on to injury, your creatinine criteria is going to be an increase in creatinine two times the baseline to 2.9 times the baseline with a urine output criteria of less than 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour for 12 hours. You're, you're moving into 12 hours range. You've got the risk, then you have your injury. This is when you can start causing damage to the kidneys. So failure is the essentially triple the baseline of the creatinine. So if your baseline is 1.1, then 3.3, you are in renal failure when you're accompanied by anuria or when you're accompanied by 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour of urine output, all the way down to anuria for 12 hours. That is acute kidney failure. If this persists for greater than four weeks, you're at a you're you're having loss of nephrons, loss of renal function that could be permanent. So greater than three months, you are essentially in end stage kidney disease. As far as the CCRN test is concerned, I know that kidneys can recover down the line, but however, kidneys can rarely recover after that. But for the test, this is going to be considered end stage kidney disease when you're at this level of creatinine and urine output for greater than three months. So we learned about the types of renal failure. This is going to be the types of causes of renal failure. So you have your pre-renal failure, which is before the kidney. And this is the most common type of renal failure, which rarely requires dialysis. This is essentially reduced perfusion to the kidneys. However, no destruction of the tubular membranes occur. This can progress to intrarenal failure if not treated. Intral renal failure is the worst type of kidney failure you can have. So common causes of pre-renal failure is decreased cardiac output, such as heart failure, MI, cardiogenic shock, cardiac tamponade, dysrhythmias, pulmonary embolism, conditions that cause vasodilation, such as sepsis, ACE inhibitors, NSAIDs, anaphylaxis, states of vasoconstriction, and vasoconstriction states such as pressors and compensatory responses uh, that the body is going through to try to correct this vasodilation and decrease cardiac output. You can also have pre-renal failure from volume depletion, such as hemorrhage, GI losses, diuretics, burns, pancreatitis, ileus, and inadequate volume replacement. So it's important to understand the pre-renal concept and how to fix them. So the pre-renal common causes of failure as far as drugs are concerned are the ACE inhibitors and NSAIDs. Both can result in reduced glomerular filtration rates. ACE inhibitors cause the efferent arteriole, which is the arteriole after the glomerulus, to remain dilated, not allowing constriction, therefore reduce the pressure gradient that is required for the glomeruli to be perfused appropriately. So essentially, the blood is passing through the glomeruli too quickly and therefore not being allowed to slow down and maintain a certain pressure to be filtered appropriately. So the NSAIDs is the double whammy, even with normal doses, can cause the afferent arteriole, which is the arteriole that brings the blood to the glomeruli. NSAIDs cause this arteriole to remain constricted, not allowing dilation, again reducing the pressure gradient required to perfuse the glomeruli appropriately. So this means that not enough blood is getting to the glomerulus, and once it gets there, it's going by too quickly because the efferent arteriole is still dilated. So NSAIDs NSAIDs and, and ACE inhibitors are pretty bad for pre-renal failure. So what do you do in pre-renal states? So first, you're going to correct the underlying problem if you are able. The goal is to increase renal perfusion. So to do this, you're going to decrease the preload and afterload of the heart, essentially making the heart work less hard but more efficiently. You're going to improve the contractility of the heart, again, more efficiently. And you're going to give them IV fluids to maintain your mean arterial pressure of greater than 70 millimeters of mercury. This will help perfuse those kidneys most appropriately and most effectively. So you want to avoid ACE inhibitors and NSAIDs in high-risk patients. You want to avoid nephrotoxic agents such as contrast, and you want to change your drugs to the renal dosing. There's a lot of drugs out there that are excreted renally, and if you are giving the normal amount of doses when you're in renal failure, you're going to that's essentially going to be nephrotoxic to the kidney, making renal failure worse. So moving on to the intrarenal failure, this is renal failure that is pathologically and anatomically inside the kidney. In intrarenal failure, you have a reduced perfusion of the kidneys with the tubular membrane destruction. This is called acute tubular necrosis. 
patients will have to have a lot of damage to their tubules to be able to considered intrarenal failure. So the types of causes for this is nephrotoxic agents, which have a better prognosis for the patient and typically is non-oliguric, meaning they're putting out more urine than an oliguric state. So they're putting out maybe a reduced amount, but they're still not really low on the low side. So there's better hope for the kidneys, essentially. A lot of things that can be nephrotoxic is contrast dye, antibiotics, NSAIDs, Rhabdomyolysis, which again is the breakdown of the muscle, a lot of damage to the muscle, basically hitting those membranes with a lot of protein. Organic solvents and um, heavy metals. These organic solvents could be people that ingest ethanol or, or things like that, essentially poison. The worst prognosis for intrarenal failure is ischemia. If you have a kidney that's not being perfused with the amount of blood it needs, it's going to have cell death and acute tubular necrosis from not enough oxygen, from not enough blood flow, essentially. And this is going to be on approximately an allegoric stage of kidney failure. You're going to have a reduced amount of urine and basically the under the minimal amount of urine output needed. States that can cause this is surgical, post cabbage repair, valve repair, vascular repair. This, this is going to reduce the cardiac output and therefore not perfuse the kidney as well. You can also have the same results from hypotension, sepsis, hypovolemia, and every single cause of pre-renal failure and post-renal failure. You're asking, how is it post-renal failure if there's just a blockage of urine down the line? How is that going to make the kidney ischemic? Well, when you have pressure building up in the urinary system, your kidney can become dilated from this pressure. And therefore, when the pressure inside that kidney is greater than the, the flow of the blood pressure, then, you're, then the kidney is not going to be perfused and therefore leaving it ischemic. You can also get intrarenal failure from autoimmune inflammation diseases such as SLE, vasculitis, hepatitis, varicella, and strep. Those are some of the causes of intrarenal failure. It's important to remember prerenal failure can progress to intrarenal failure. And then all the causes of intrarenal failure can be due to prerenal and postrenal failure. So intrarenal failure management. Maintain fluid volume while monitoring for fluid overload. You want to maintain normal electrolyte balance, especially hyperkalemia. And if it's due to an acid-base imbalance, you're going to dialyze for extreme acidosis. So the normal acid-base balance is 7.35 to 7.45 on the pH scale for your blood. So for every 0.1 of pH drop, this is just a general concept to remember. There is some d diminishing returns, but for every 0.1 of pH drop, you're going to have an increase in potassium by 0.6. So for example, if your patient is 7.30 on the pH level, you're a little bit acidotic. If they drop to 7.20 on the pH scale, their potassium approximately your potassium will rise by 0.6. So that's just a generality. Don't use that as absolute, but just know that the concept is as you get more acidotic, you're going to get more hyperkalemic. So you also want to prevent uremia, which is again increased BUN, by dialyzing early. It's funny to hear that because a lot of our a lot of the nephrologists I've worked with they seem to wait and wait and wait before they dialyze. What they're doing is just trying to let the kidney recover. But again, for the test, you want to prevent uremia by dialyzing early. And you want to adjust drugs for the renal dosing, as I mentioned on the previous slide. And you want to prevent malnutrition. Do not restrict the protein. Because again, if you're in intrarenal failure, uh, there's damage to the tubules, there's damage to the glomerular membranes, they're going to be allowing large proteins to pass, which could decrease your oncotic pressure. So keep giving proteins, keep giving the patient as much nutrition as they can. We want to increase and maintain that oncotic pressure, which will help perfuse the kidneys. Moving on, we're going to definitely prevent infection as uh, renal failure exhibits a more poor immune function. You also want to manage anemias, the packed red blood cells you're going to give for extreme anemia while using epigen for chronic renal failure. So patients that are in acute renal failure, you're not going to use epigen. You're going to just go ahead and transfuse them for their anemia. And also you can consider dialysis. That's not the first line. That's, that's the last line. That's the last thing to essentially save their life. Here's a table that will 
demonstrate the lab value changes and the difference in lab values in pre-renal versus intra-renal failure. For your pre-renal, your BUN creatinine ratio is going to be 20 to 40 to 1. A good indicator, a good thing to remember, is just 20 to 1. So if your BUN creatinine ratio is 20 to 1 or greater, you're more than likely going to be pre-renal. Your specific gravity is going to be high. It's going to be concentrated. Your urine osmolality is going to be high, again, concentrated. And it's going to be over 500. Your urine concentration, I've said it twice, is going to be concentrated. Your urine sodium is going to be less than 20. And this is because your urine is, your kidneys are still able to reabsorb sodium and water. You're going to have some urinary sediment. It's going to be normal, hyaline cas, And the response to Lasix, because you're going to give them a Lasix challenge in pre-renal failure to try and jumpstart the kidneys. So this is going to be a response to Lasix. is going to be responsive. It's going to produce an increase of greater than 40 milliliters per hour. They're not. You know, they could be dehydrated or they could be an intra-renal failure. So for pre-renal, you're going to have essentially concentrated urine and a BUN creatinine of 20 to 1. For intrarenal failure and intrarenal distinction, your BUN creatinine ratio is going to be 10 to 15 to 1, but you can just say 10 to 1. Your specific gravity is going to be low, so dilute. Your urine osmolality is going to be low, again dilute. Your urine concentration is going to be dilute. So why is your urine concentration going to be dilute in intrarenal failure? I thought intrarenal failure was the worst one. It is the worst one when you talk in early stages of intrarenal failure. You, you have your membrane damage, you're losing proteins, you're losing water, your, your tubules and your kidneys are not able to reabsorb that sodium, reabsorb that water. That's why everything's leaving the body. So it's dilute at the early stages. And then, you know, you can go aneuric in, into the later stages and in stage kidney disease. So urinary sodium is going to be greater than 20 milliequivalents per liter, again, because it's not able to reabsorb that sodium as well. You're going to have urinary sediment, cellular cast, and debris, which is abnormal. There's not going to be a response to Lasix, essentially because your absorption is already impaired and you're already dilute. So some B win creatinine ratio examples I've got for you. So I want you to determine if you're pre-renal or intra-renal based on the BUN creatinine ratio. So pause the video if you need more time. So we'll move on to the next slide, which are the answers. So your BUN creatinine ratio for the first one is going to be roughly 22 to 1. And how you get that number is by dividing 4.7 into 106. So you want to divide by 106 by 4.7. That'll get you approximately 22 to 1. 22 BU and a 1 creatinine. So that's going to be pre-renal. For the next one, it's going to be pre-renal because your pre-renal BU and creatinine ratio is going to be approximately 21 to 1. Again, dividing 70 by 3.2. Moving on, if you have a level of BU uh, BUN that's 90 and your creatinine is 9.6, dividing that into 90, you're going to get approximately 9.5 to 1. That is going to be intra-renal. That is 10 or less. Moving on to the next one, your creatinine ratio, your BUN creatinine ratio, is going to be approximately 4.4 to 1. That's dividing 10.9 into 48. So 4.4 to 1 is less than 10, so that's going to be intrarenal. So for the last one, 92 BUN creatinine 2.7, that's going to be pre-renal because that ratio is approximately 34 to 1. That's a really high ratio. That means you're going to be pre-renal. So you want to be, how do you fix these patients? You're going to be treating the patient like you would a pre-renal patient. So you would need to refer to the slide for the pre-renal treatments. Again, refer to the slide for intra-renal treatments to be able to distinguish what to do for which patient. Post-renal failure. This is approximately 5 to 10% of acute renal failure and can cause by, again, obstruction from the collecting ducts to the external urethral opening. So this is essentially any blockage from when the urine starts collecting to right before the urine exits the body. Again, this can progress to intrarenal failure if not treated. 
Some common causes of the blockages of post-renal is neurogenic bladder, again, from either diabetes or neurological disorders, tumor, prostate enlargement due to a stricture or benign prostate hyperplasia, or ureteral blockage due to kidney stones and strictures, that sort of thing. So it's one of the easier things to treat than intrarenal. So it's just essentially finding the blockage and then removing the blockage before they progress to intrarenal failure. Because if they get there, they'll have to do, you'll have to do a lot more to get those kidneys to restart back. Post-renal failure management. And this type, this is the easiest type of renal failure to treat. Just like I said, you want to find to and move, remove the obstruction. Some concepts to understand for the renal portion is contrast-induced nephropathy. So contrast, that's going to be affecting the kidneys. Some of the risks of inducing nephropathy of the kidneys uh, are diabetes patients, dehydrated patients, heart failure, elderly, large doses of contrast. Again, uses of NSAIDs, ACE inhibitors. Metformin is a big one. And pre-existing renal insufficiency or renal issues such as hypotension, that sort of thing. Signs of contrast-induced nephropathy is an elevated BUN and creatinine, fluid overload, and anuria. So one of the initial treatments for contrast-induced nephropathy is diuretics. And if you don't have a response from that, you're going to treat that as intrarenal failure. So how do you prevent contrast-induced nephropathy? Well, you're going to have to weigh the benefits versus the risks. If we have a patient that's not doing so well, hypotensive, dehydrated, uh, heart failure patient with poor kidney perfusion anyway, we're going to probably not give those patients uh, the largest dose of contrast. We could reduce that level of contrast or not give them contrast in general. And you can also hydrate the patient with normal saline prior to the procedure and post-procedure. And you can do that, again, normal saline or D5W with bicarb. So you want to give bicarb because when you have kidney failure, you can get into a metabolic acidosis. The bicarb will help fight that acidosis. You want to avoid offending drugs such as metformin. Uh, that's a big one to hold prior to giving contrast. Again, ACE inhibitors. NSAIDs, that sort of thing. And I was taught in nursing school to give acetylcysteine, mucomist, you know, to help protect the kidneys, but this is more than likely not going to be on the exam, just to for you to be aware of that. Another concept to understand is rhabdomyolysis. Common causes include, again, I've mentioned before, prolonged immobility, compartment syndrome, hyperthermia, delirium tremens, the DTs, and crush injuries. This have to be massive crush injuries. You don't just fall and and bust your elbow, you've got some massive injuries to really send out a lot of creatinine kinase, which is going to, again, hurt your kidneys. Your myoglobin is also an indicator of that, and potassium. So um, when you damage your cells, you're going to release creatinine kinase, myoglobin, and potassium. So you have large crush injuries. You can have increased CK, increased myoglobin, and increased potassium. So a large volumes of these CK and myoglobin are going to obstruct your renal tubules. Again, causing decreased perfusion and uh, end up in renal failure. Your clinical presentation of rhabdomyolysis is hyperkalemia, hypovolemia, metabolic acidosis, and acute renal failure. Some signs and symptoms include low urine output, tea colored, often concentrated, and dark. Serum CK above 10,000 can be even closer to 20,000. And myoglobin detected in the urine. Muscle cramping and arrhythmias are also sign and symptom. Some treatment for the rhabdomyolysis is you're going to monitor and treat your hyperkalemia. You're also going to give lots and lots of fluids. You're going to give normal saline to maintain urine output of approximately 300 milliliters an hour. And that means you're going to be given normal saline up to 500 milliliters an hour. But you need to really watch out for fluid overload. And at the same time, you need to flush out the body system and the kidneys as, as fast and as safe as you can. Again, the bicarbonate infusion, uh, making changing you from metabolic acidosis to alkalization, and then continuing treatment until no myoglobin is found in the urine, until essentially everything's been washed out. We have a little acronym here for indications for dialysis if your you know treatments don't work for intrarenal failure. A E I O U. A is acidosis. E electrolyte imbalance typically hyperkalemia. I is intoxication. This is intoxication such as methanol, ethylene glycol. Those are those organic solvents I've mentioned earlier, lithium and theophylline. O for overload, mainly heart failure. 
and U for uremia, which again is elevated BUN, which causes mental status change. So those are your indications for dialysis. And that's a last resort measure to treat this patient for kidney failure. So several types of hemodialysis types, you have your intermittent and you have your continuous. Your intermittent is for people that are more stable. Continuous is for people that cannot handle major fluid shifts that the intermittent dialysis does. So it's going to run a lot slower. So some of your accesses you're going to have for HD is double lumen HD catheter, which can be temporary or permanent. Your permanent catheter is going to have a cuffed catheter that's going to allow your skin to grow into it to be able to maintain a, a more important a layer of protection against infection and has to be typically surgically removed. You can have AV graft accesses, fistulas, and a peritoneal HD port. Just know that peritoneal HD is not for the acute kidney failure patients. These patients are going to be those chronic patients that are safe and can do dialysis at home. So you're not likely to find peritoneal dialysis on the CCRN test, but just be aware of that concept. So continuous renal replacement therapy, CRRT, that is the continuous dialysis type. There's two types of CRRT, could be arteriovenous or venovenous. So there's four different modes. It's important to understand that these go in order from the least amount of treatment to the max amount of treatment. So SCUF is slow continuous ultrafiltration. CVVH is continuous venovenous hemofiltration. CVVHD is continuous venovenous hemodialysis, and CVVHDF is your max amount of fluid and your max amount of filtration that you can do. So again, the continuous renal replacement therapy is going to be for those unstable patients that cannot handle those large fluid shifts for intermittent dialysis. So I have some of the common abnormalities of electrolytes here in the next few slides. I will go ahead and make some PDF of these and put them on the website, lifelongnursing.com. I'll also put a link to the description in the YouTube video for these PDFs so you can study them and print them out and study them. Some of the electrolyte imbalances that can occur in renal failure is hypercalcemia. If a patient is hypercalcemic, their calcium is going to be greater than 10.5, which will also present and hypophosphatemia. That's essentially saying people that have too much calcium will typically have not enough phosphorus. Some of the signs and symptoms of too much calcium is lethargy, fatigue, altered mental status, decreased deep tendon reflexes, muscle weakness, kidney stones, because those are a lot of made of our calcium, and then nausea, vomiting, and a metallic taste in their mouth. Some of the causes of hypercalcemia is renal disease, hyperparathyroidism, Essentially, the body is bringing too much calcium out of the bones into the serum. Prolonged immobility and cancer malignancies. Treatment for hypercalcemia is normal saline to promote diuresis. Ferrosamide to increase renal excretion. You're going to be watching for hypokalemia. Calcitonin to put that calcium back into the bones. And glutocorticoids. Hypocalcemia is calcium level less than 8.5. And if remember, if the same with hypercalcemia, if you have too little calcium, this patient is more than likely going to have too much phosphorus. Some of the signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia is anxiety, irritability, laryngeospasm, seizures, torsades de puentes, chivastex sign, and torso sign. So if you remember way back in nursing school when you remembered when you were taught chivastic sign, the chivastic sign is when you tap on the cheek to where your facial nerve is and you're going to have some spasming of your cheek and, and lip muscles, which is hyperexcitability, irritability, and that's called tetany. But you're going to have a positive sign if that reacts, if your facial nerve reacts to you tapping on that. The trousseau sign is when you inflate a blood pressure cuff on your over your brachial artery, leaving it on there for a minute or two, two, three minutes, and then you're going to have some spasming of your hand, a carpopedal spasm. So your wrist is going to be flexing. Both of these are involuntary. Those are the signs of hypocalcemia. Some of the causes of hypocalcemia is acute pancreatitis, hypoparathyroidism, not drawing enough 
calcium out of your bones, chronic renal failure, a vitamin D deficiency, and that's because you need vitamin D to absorb calcium, hypoalbumin anemia, and that's because when you have low oncotic pressure, when you have low albumin in your blood, you have nowhere for your calcium ion to attach to. It's attached to an albumin molecule. If you have don't have a lot of albumin, then you'll need to get a serum ionized calcium that will give you the true amount of uh, calcium in your blood. Again, alkalotic states, prolonged vomiting, hyperventilation. Some treatment for hypocalcemia is IV fluids, normal saline, calcium gluconate, calcium chloride administration, giving vitamin D so you can absorb that calcium, and you want to correct any respiratory alkalosis. Moving on to phosphate, when you have high phosphate, that's hyperphosphatemia, that's a level of phosphate over 4.5 milliequivalents per liter. Just like in calcium, if you have high phosphate, you're going to have a patient that's most likely low in calcium. Some of the signs and symptoms of high phosphate is anxiety, irritability, laryngeospasm, seizures. It's the same as hypocalcemia. Again, with the Trousseau sign and the Chavostek sign. Causes of hyperphosphatemia can be decreased renal excretion and renal failure. Treatment for this is using a phosphate binder and giving calcium carbonate. When you increase that calcium level, it's going to bring down that phosphate level. So moving down to hypophosphatemia, this is a phosphate level less than 3.0 milliequivalents per liter. Again, if you have a patient that's too low in phosphate, they are more than likely going to be in a state of too much calcium. Some of the signs and symptoms of hypophosphatemia is lethargy, fatigue, often mental status, decreased tendon reflexes, muscle weakness, constipation, peptic ulcers, abdominal pain, and the symptoms that are the same as hypercalcemia, such as kidney stones. Again, I will put a link to these videos to study. So some causes of hypophosphatemia is alcoholism, increased cellular uptake of phosphorus, which is, happens in TPN, and increased glucose uptake, which again happens with TPN. When you're giving patients TPN, you also probably have to replace their phosphorus. So the treatment, again, is just replacing the phosphorus. Simple as that. Moving on to potassium, this is a state of having a high potassium over 5.1 milliequivalents per liter is hyperkalemia. Some signs and symptoms include muscle weakness, irritability, muscle cramps, pain, nausea, vomiting. And then for your ECG changes, when you have high potassium, you're going to more than likely have peaked T waves, a QRS that's widening. It can get so wide that you can go into arrhythmias and VTAC and eventually PEA. So you're going to have some loss of P waves, bradycardia, and PEA. Some of the causes of hyperkalemia is renal failure, again, massive crush injuries, burns, which is early. So when you have damage to cells, damage to muscles, such as those in burns, your, your cells are going to be releasing potassium. So that's why this is an early stage of burns. Acidosis, again, every 0.1 pH that goes down, you're going to, in general, have a rise of potassium 0.6. Adrenal cortical insufficiency and excessive intake. So treatment, I've got these all in red because you should know these as a nurse, even if you're not doing the CCRN test. Treatment for acute hyperkalemia that's non-emergent, you're going to give K-exalate. Emergent treatment of hyperkalemia could include dialysis. However, before you get to that, you can give drugs such as calcium chloride, calcium gluconate, sodium bicarbonate, insulin, glucose, albuterol, and furosemide. That is a quick way to get down your potassium without waiting on K-exalate and without waiting on dialysis. So if your potassium level is 5.5, you're not going to be given calcium chloride, insulin, furosemide. Uh, but if it's 6, you'll probably give K-exalate. And if it's over that, I would say you're probably going to be giving uh, drugs such as calcium chloride and things like that. Hypokalemia to little potassium is under 3.5 milliequivalents per liter. This could be low. Just be aware that hypokalemia could be caused by low magnesium because your body needs magnesium to be able to properly intake and hold on to potassium. 
Some of the signs and symptoms of hypokalemia include muscle weakness, decreased deep tendon reflexes, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, shallow respirations, mental depression, and on your ECG, it can be irritable and fast. Think ventricular tachycardia and ventricle fibrillation. Some causes of hypokalemia could include metabolic alkalosis, acute alcoholism, and I got that starred in red, so this is acute alcoholism, cirrhosis, uncontrolled diabetes, such as DKA, or such as hyperglycemic hyperosmotic syndrome, excessive perspiration, excessive aldosterone. Treatment for hypokalemia include giving potassium chloride, giving them the potassium back. You can also give them lactic rinkers, although it's not as quick as potassium chloride. You should also probably give them magnesium sulfate, especially in those patients that have chronically low hypokalemia. It could be due to magnesium levels. So I would want to draw a magnesium level for people that have an acutely low potassium level. And you want to correct the alkalosis because if your patient stays alkalotic, again, that potassium is not going to be held on to. Moving on to magnesium, hypermagnesemia. When you have too much magnesium, that's going to be magnesium level that's over 2.5 milliequivalents per liter. Some signs and symptoms of too much magnesium is decreased deep tendon reflexes, respiratory depression or rest. You can have some bradyarrhythmias, hypotension, lethargy, coma, nausea, vomiting, flushing. So the way I remember this is just thinking of pregnant ladies who are on a magnesium drip. So they slow down and reduce the contractions and the strength of the contractions of the uterus. So muscle depression, decreased deep tendon reflexes, respiratory depression, that sort of thing. Some causes of hypermagnesiuma is renal failure, laxative abuse that contain magnesium. Yes, unfortunately, people do this. And acid abuse that contain magnesium. People may do these both absentmindedly. And iatrogenic overdose, meaning giving them too much magnesium replacement. Some treatment for this is to discontinue magnesium substances, give calcium, and the reason you're giving them calcium gluconate or calcium chloride is to protect the heart. If, if they're hyperkalemic, you're going to give them things to not irritate the heart, essentially. Also, you can give furosemide and you could dialyze the magnesium out. Typically, you are not going to have somebody dialyzed for too, too much magnesium. It will eventually work its way down. Too low magnesium, hypomagnesemia, is magnesium level that is 1.6 milliequivalents per liter or less. Essentially, all of these are going to vary by laboratory standards, but in general, 1.6 or less. Some say 1.7. So too little magnesium will cause hyperreflexia. Again, positive Chavostic sign, positive Trousseau sign. You're going to have ventricular arrhythmias, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. You can have an increase in digoxin sensitivity, agitation, confusion, hinders potassium correction, and also an insulin resistance and low potassium. Some of the causes is chronic alcoholism, not acute, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and malabsorptions, uh, such as uh, having a patient that is NGT, has a nasogastric tube to walk suction for a long period of time. Post-surgery, such as cabbage, acute MI, and states that uncontrolled diabetes, such as DKA and hyperglycemic hyperosmotic syndrome, hyperthyroidism, aminoglycosides, diuretics, and alcohol, of course, digoxin cisplatin. That drug is a chemotherapy drug. And again, malnutrition. So some treatment for low magnesium is giving them magnesium sulfate. In an emergent setting, you can give a max of one gram per minute. But normally, the typical rate is about one gram an hour. Moving on to sodium. I know this is a lot of electrolytes, but this is the last one. So sodium level is normally 135 to 145, and anything over 145 is hypernatremia. Some signs and symptoms of hypernatremia is essentially those signs of dehydration. So thirst, tachycardia, orthostasis, hypotension, dry mucous membranes, restlessness, irritability, stupor, and coma. Some causes of hypernatremia include insensible losses, you know, breathing, sweating, that sort of thing, dehydration, osmotic diuresis from giving mannitol, DKA, and diabetes insipidus. This diabetes insipidus is when you're putting out way too much urine. So for the treatment, you're going to correct slowly to prevent cerebral edema. And you can do this by giving D5W or half normal saline. 
You can give a sodium restriction, and you can identify the causes. So, if, for example, if they're in diabetes insipidus, you can replace the hormone vasopressin or ADH. You can give those. That should be corrected just by giving vasopressin. If you want to see if you're hypovolemic, uh, you can just do a urine sodium level, and if it's over 20, you're essentially concentrated and uh, hypovolemic. So then you at that point would give definitely give fluids, but typically the, the gold standard is given fluids, typically D5W. Hyponatremia patients are patients that have sodium less than 135, and some of the signs and symptoms include edema, fatigue, muscle cramps, weakness, lethargy, confusion, decreased deep tendon reflexes, abdominal cramps, diarrhea, seizures, coma, and brain herniation. So this brain can herniate essentially from cerebral edema, causes a fluid overload, heart failure, cirrhosis, excessive water ingestion, otherwise known as water intoxication, SIADH, this is a symptom of an inappropriate ADH, and excessive IV fluids such as D5W. So you want to fix this, you're going to treat by identifying the cause. If it's fluid overload or water toxicity, you're going to put them on a fluid restriction. And you can give loop diuretics to help get rid of some of that edema, concentrate your fluid in your body, which will increase your sodium. And you can replace the sodium by giving them 3% saline or like some fluid such as mannitol. Again, I will make these into PDFs and put a link in the description, and they will also be on lifelongnursing.com. Thank you for watching, guys. Be sure to watch the videos for the CCRN renal practice questions. Also, if you're interested in more free CCRN content and more helpful information, please visit lifelongnursing.com. Be sure to subscribe before you leave and enjoy your day. Learn everything. Mm -hmm.